Hello, and thank you for joining us for uh, this short webinar or video about Packet Trap MSP and how to configure the Avaya configuration module both on the uh, site administrator side as well as on the Packet Trap MSP interface. My name is Mike Plotkin, and I'm one of the system consultants here. If you are new to Packet Trap MSP and would like to find out more information, please visit our website at packettrapmsp.com. You can download either the RMM or the PTPSA of uh, our solution. I'd like to start this video by explaining the steps that need to be taken on the actual site administration via module emulation under the advanced settings. To start the emulation, you will need to connect to the network and the Avaya module. Once that is done, there is a few simple commands that need to be run in order to configure the RTCP and CDR settings. The first step and the first command is to change the system parameters. Let's go ahead and put that in there. And I'm getting all these commands, guys, uh, through simply following the instructions on the user guide that is provided with the site administrator. So first thing that's most important, you want to go ahead and point the uh, RTCP, the real-time uh, control protocol packets that are sent by the actual, uh, the, the, the actual device to the agent that's monitoring this device over port 5005. The next step would be to change the IP network region. Go ahead and just click enter. It'll take you back to the command prompt here. And then we're going to configure region 1. There's an additional step if you click next. Make sure that RTCP report enabled is enabled. Just make sure it's on live. And same thing with the server parameters. Go ahead and click enter once you are done. And that'll take us back to the command prompt. After we've enabled the RPTC, we're going to go ahead and uh, configure the CDR, which is what provides us with the actual uh, call statistics. First thing we're going to do is add the node names. So this is the monitoring server, and these are just the associated IP addresses to that. Next, we're going to configure, once click enter, we're going to configure the CDR link. You can add as many of these here as you want. And just go ahead and click enter. Once that is done, we're going to configure the CDR parameters. Go ahead and copy that link in there. Click enter. Month, date, year. Whether we're going to have uh, interest switch voice over IP traffic that we want to monitor for MOS jitter as well. And if we did click yes on this, then I click enter here and let's configure the interest switch CDR. And over there you just have to provide the extension list of the phones within that switch environment. The final step would be to configure the trunk group. So we're just going to click on enter here and configure the trunk group for region 1. Make sure that CDR report is enabled. And you're done on the Avaya module site administration site. Now we're going to go ahead and navigate over to the uh, Packetrap MSP interface. And you'll find the modules right here in the, the navigation tree that we have on the left-hand side. 
go ahead and right click on the module, click on add new. We both have a PBX as well as an Avaya small office business for small business offices. Let's double click on the uh, Avaya Aurora module or click add module. Wait for the wizard to pop up. So the first thing we're going to do is going to go ahead and add the communication manager. I'm going to hit select add new devices. 10.6.196.35 is our communication manager. I'm going to change the agent that I want to monitor the device and make sure that we have our SNMP community strings selected for the Avaya. If you have not done so already, you can go ahead and click on manage credentials and create a new Avaya SNMP community string. I'm going to click next. I'll just wait a couple of seconds. And finish. We've now added our Avaya communication manager. I'm going to configure the Avaya monitors and alerts. And if we want to put in blackout policies, we can go ahead and do that from here. The next thing we're going to want to have to add is the Avaya gateway. Select device. I'm sorry. Add a new device. Again, we're going to change the agent that we're monitoring this. And there's no special reason why I'm doing this. It's just that the uh, other agent that I had selected here previously is not on our LAN. 10.6.196.36. Is the gateway. Oops. I'm just going to finish. Yes, and we're done. A couple of options here. You can add related devices like the Cisco switches uh, or, or uh, firewalls or routers that are in play with the network itself. You can also add the uh, individual phones. And here you would configure the um, appropriate MOS latency packet loss jitter settings that you would want to create a baseline off, so to speak, for the alerts. And click apply, and we're done. So here you have the summary of the devices, the uh, MOS jitter latency, the live QoS, active streams. We have active calls going, broken down into top 20, top 50, the call history in the last hour, last day, last month as well as we break down the MOS in the last hour, last day, last month, last week. Same thing with packet loss. And you can also see by last hour, uh, MOS jitter, latency, and whatnot. And that is a quick overview of how to set up the Packet Trap MSP via module. Please join us next time as uh, I will go over patch management, uh, onboarding best practices, as well as uh, videos on custom scripting, ESX, monitoring, and a host of other things that Packetrap MSP and Packetrap PSA can do. Again, if you have any questions, please uh, visit our website at Packetrap.com or email sales at Packetrap.com if you are interested in a demo, a full or detailed evaluation, we'd be happy to provide you. Thank you again guys for listening. I look forward to speaking with you all soon. Hello, and thank you for joining me. My name is Mike Plotkin. I'm one of the system consultants here at Twice Packer Trap MSP. This is a short video, about 30 minutes intended to kind of go over some of the best practice implementation for patch management as well as some initial onboarding when you're adding new customers to Packer Trap MSP.
If you are new to Package Wrap and are just joining us to hear about the solution and whatnot, I recommend that you download our RMM tool for a 21 day free trial or our PSA tool for another 21 day free trial. Best way to get you know hands on and understand and learn what our solution can do for you is to just go ahead and jump in the water and swim. Very easy to set up and configure it and one of our sales consultants and uh, systems engineers will reach out to you to assist with any implementation configuration issues you might have. Once you've onboarded some initial customers and deployed agents, and I'll cover some uh, additional deployment and agents and alerting in uh, further webinars to come, but for now I just want to kind of stick to the patch management. The first thing after you deploy the agents and devices and you run the network discovery, which I'll talk about in a little bit, you want to go ahead and go navigate to the configuration tab at the top. Here's all our modules here. And go into patch management. So from a best practice perspective, you want to create groups based on the type of OSs that you are managing, that your customers have and you can create groups for a particular vendor or OS that you currently do not have in the anticipation of the near future that you might have a customer that does have you know let's say a Vista or an XP primarily right now you might just be dealing with Windows 7. Creating a group within patch management here is very simple just navigate to the add group give it a friendly name so here I have uh, one thing I am missing is an SBS 2011 which is just really a little bit different than an actual 2008 server. Go ahead and click on OK. And it's going to prompt me a settings tab to configure what I want to do with the patches. I'll talk about that in a second. You can see here that it asks you for to add devices. We could add devices from here uh, if you already have if you've already deployed the agents, but let's assume that you have not, you're not going to see any devices here. So um, we're just creating groups. There's another way to deploy the agents to here from the home screen and I'll show you how to do that. So this is just one way where you can add the devices if you have already deployed the solution or at least deployed the initial agents and, and uh, added the networking devices. And all you do is just highlight the devices you want. Click on add and then click on add here. And this is a good way to separate them by vendor or the type of role they have, whether it's a server or computer or whatnot. You can also create groups based on customers. So there's no, um, there's no right way of creating groups. The benefit of creating groups is to spread the load on the both on the network and on your server you don't want to go ahead and install or scan a thousand devices that have different OS's and install the agent all install the updates on a thousand devices all at the same time you want to disperse that traffic as much as possible so you can install patches you know on your server 2003's every Sunday and install patches on server 2008's every Saturday um, you never want to install patches during the daytime when customers or uh, their employees are actually at the office because uh, depending on the patch whether it requires a reboot or uh, depending on their network traffic at that particular moment it may cause some interference so you want to install patches either later in the day or early in the morning so every group is going to have a different time to have the patches installed. In some cases you might want to scan the devices all at the same time. Scanning is not going to take that much of uh, that much system performance to do, but installing the patches will. So what you'll do is you have a couple options. You can configure Windows Update using patch management which will pretty much override the group policies and whatever the device is configured so our agent on that device is going to go hey Mr. Computer you need to go ahead and install these patches that I have approved at this time. 
The second option is to just simply configure automatic updates, whether to turn them off, notify the user that there are updates available, uh, automatically download recommended updates and install schedule below, or just allow the user to install them on their own time. And really this is a personal choice of uh, depending on how your SLAs are structured, whether you actually are being paid to do the patch management for the customer, or you're just covering um, from an operational perspective, perspective, you're just covering your, yourself to have the patches downloaded. So at least you're providing them a quality service. You can also simply monitor patches for those devices that really you don't have that much uh, use of, I should say, or you're not working with as much of the, the customers not paying you to manage them, but you still want to know what patches are available or could be available for that device so that when the time comes, you have that information for you and you can actually you know, run a report to show the customer, hey, these are the patches that you don't have. I'd like for you to you know, pay me to move you into my gold SLA so that I can start patching these items for you. Otherwise, your system is going to experience a lot of downtime. As we all know, when you don't have patches installed, as I don't on my system right here, I don't have all the patches installed, it could cause some quirks and, and little things here and there that may not work right. So having a fully patched system is recommended. Once you've set up the policies, you will have in here, once the system actually runs the scan, and you can customize in this in advance. I'm just going to go jump into this one where I have one device. You can customize in advance, for instance, critical and security updates that are critical and have high priority. Currently, we have the default action set to pending, but if I wanted to, I can just go ahead and select approve, and this way it'll approve all these patches when they get scanned and install them at that particular time. There may be, however, patches that you want to go ahead and research the KB article too, and in that sense, you might want to go ahead and approve these patches. There's also a way to reject patches on a whole. You can do it individually as well. So if I click on the other column to a little bit to the left of the right of pending approval, the default action, I can go ahead and approve based on the actual patch itself. So not pull a whole dragnet or uh, a net, just every patch gets approved. I can go ahead and specify which patches I want to approve and which ones I don't. and make sure that you go ahead and click save when that is done. So one of the things I mentioned earlier was how to add, once you have the groups within patch management configured, how to add these devices if you had not initially done the onboarding. So what you want to do is, now the patch management does require that an agent is present on the device. If I highlight a device and I right click on it, and I go to monitors and alerts, I don't have anywhere where I can send patches to a patch management group or send the device to a patch management group. However, if I highlight two devices, one of which is an agent, I do get that option assigned to patch management. And all I'm going to do is click on the which group I want to put that in here from our device view tab. And notice how I have an agent and a non-agent device selected. An agent device is that when you see a little guy right here in a gray suit it's only going to add the agent device to the group. So theoretically, I could have selected everything here, I'm sorry, and only one device would have been added to that group. Just a little shortcut. The next thing you want to go ahead and set up is log alert configuration for patch management. We're going to go ahead and add a rule, select the entry type, patch management, and we don't really need to be alerted off when an update is installed succeeded. You might. It's a personal choice. Uh, but we do, however, recommend that you have an update install fail and Windows update settings have changed. Go ahead and select to whom you want this email to be sent to out of the user accounts that you will also create. And you're done. One of the reports that we have is this executive summary report, which will show you the status of all your agent devices and the missing patches, whether they're patched or, uh, or to what degree they're patched, and you'll find that right here. So patching not enabled, 
available patches, 62. And again, this is completely brandable, so your logo will go everywhere you see Packet Trap MSP. The next uh, part I'd like to talk about is onboarding an initial customer and how to set things up. Before you onboard a customer, you have access to the server policies. And what I recommend is you configure the server policy to meet a uh, general high-level overview of all the services, application errors, networking, memory that are generally specific to whether it's an SPS 2011 or it's 2003 server. Um, we know that DNS, DHTP, uh, Kibosi, Cryptologic Services, uh, Remote Desktop, all these will be across the board on all these devices. Once we've set up a general server policy, we might have specific critical servers that are running critical applications such as Exchange, SQL, Active Directory, um, might be you know VM as well. We have a VM policy, so that's a separate discussion. Um, you might have a Linux server, uh, which will be also a little bit different than the general Windows servers. But what you want to do once you have that set up within this policy, so don't we don't have to recreate different policies. And the reason you want to do this is because Exchange and SQL tend to run high on memory. So if you have many Exchange and SQL devices going in and configuring each one individually may become a little bit painstaking, uh, especially when you have to create a baseline for the alerts that are gen different for each device. So without having to do that, we can copy all the alerts and all the remediation and all the Windows services that we created in the server policy, they're going to be general to the Exchange server, eh, but not necessarily in terms of the baseline to it. Copy this particular server policy and create an exchange policy. This way it'll copy all the alerts again, all the services, all the conditions, all the actions, all the self-healing tasks. And when we create this exchange policy, we can then go into the exchange policy and actually customize the CPU and memory to be specific to exchange habits, exchange uh, performance metrics. So when we do from when we move forward like a month later if we want to change something we don't have to go into the individual device we can go to the policy change policy and configure it there once you've deployed the initial agent to the customers land and packer trap does require that we deploy an initial agent you're going to want to have to run a network discovery so you'll see a device like this their IP uh, the agent on there, the color code name, the host name, CPU, memory, whatnot. And you're going to go add devices. And because of our pricing model, and the fact that we allow you to manage as many endpoints as you want per customer, the best approach is to put a whole dragnet over the customer's LAN. And to do that, we're going to run the first network discovery via SNMP network discovery. This will ping and find every single device that has a heartbeat, that anything with an IP address out there, and it'll find it. Whether it's a desktop, a printer, a router, or a server, it'll find that device. And you'll find that some of them might have WMI enabled, as is custom to many Windows devices. Printers might have SNMP set to public in general. So if you know the uh, SNMP community name in beforehand, go ahead and put it in here so that when we run it, we can always add it later as well. Once you run this network discovery, you're going to have a list of all your devices such as this. One agent and a bunch of devices, whether they're desktops being managed through SNMP, WMI, or whatnot. The next step you'd want to do is highlight all the devices the same way we did with the agent. Highlight all the devices, right click, tools and deploy an agent. And our system is going to go, oh, this is a Linux and this is a router, this is a switch, we can't install an agent on this, so it's not going to. Uh, sometimes the system does get confused with these devices like a Linux based on a, that is a, really a printer. It, it thinks it's a, it's a Linux box that so tries to install an agent on there, but it's not going to be able to. So it's only, you're only going to be able to deploy agents to Windows servers, desktops, uh, laptops, and whatnot. And this way, you get the full breadth of the customer's land. You can, you can see everything into it. You can start configuring things on it. So 
if you have access to the switch, you can right click, connect, and straight from access the web GUI to the switch. Uh, we can access uh, the web GUI to a switch that is not, that we don't have to RDP anymore into the customer's environment to the server to get access to the, the web GUI of a switch. And we know a lot of things are kind of going into the web right now, or into uh, uh, a, not the web, but uh, a GUI, user GUI, uh, instead of like command line or not. But we do have Telnet and SSH built in as well. Also, when you start enabling features, one thing I'd like to highlight is create groups for them. Um, that way you can track what devices have what enabled on them. So if I enable traffic analysis on my HP ProCurve switches, I want to create a group called traffic. So if I want to go into and see which devices have that enabled, I have a group for it. I have a group for Avaya, even though I have an Avaya module, I have a group for Avaya where I have all my phones, my Cisco switches, everything that's connected to it, uh, the agent that's monitoring it, anything that has relevance to do with Avaya, I created a group for them. Same thing with Mac. I have a couple of Macs here, I created a group for Mac. Even though I can go in here and search for Mac and find it, uh, you know, sometimes that might not be that intuitive, I created a group for it because the host name may be different or might have been changed. Once you've added the devices, you're definitely going to have a couple of devices that are uh, creating false positive alerts because the system is just monitoring them. We have some pre-canned alerts set up within each policy, such as the networking policy, that says that CPU, if it's at 75%, I want you to generate an alert. My, my uh, suggestion is disable that for the first week or so to allow to create a trend chart, a baseline of, of what is the actual network activity. So that way you're not going to get mitigated or, or, or uh, you can mitigate against false positives. You're not going to get bombarded with a bunch of false positives, alerts. Once you have that baseline set up, then you go into the actual policy and say, okay, if CPU is running at 75% for five minutes, I want to receive that alert. Also to note, when you are configuring the alerts, by default, they are not set to alert you. So if I was to edit this alert, it simply is creating the alert, make sure it is going to be enabled, but there's no notification on conditions met. So you want to go down to each alert and make sure that the ones you want to get notified on, you go ahead and select that box. And also provide a severity, priority. If you're using a ticketing system, this is what's going to be populated within it. So that way you can manage and prioritize tickets. So if you receive to the same ticket from the two different customers, one may be actually paying you, the other one has not. You want to go ahead and prioritize for the person that is paying you. And obviously there's other scenarios that can go into the prioritization and severity of the alerts. For instance, if your technician is working on a lower priority case and a higher priority one comes in, he can stop what he's doing and uh, get to work on the new ticket that just been opened up. So again, just to give you an overview, when you onboard an initial customer, their devices, anything that has an average, disable the alert for it for about a week or two. Uh, baseline, you know, the more points there are that we can create, the better of an average we, we can have. And on that note, we go into the config administration section. This is where baselining is determined from. So you want to go ahead and also configure this. So on Monday, we have a different average than Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then Saturday and Sunday also have a different average. This, these go up to seven, seven days in a week. So each day can theoretically have a different average. So over a period of four weeks, our system is going to calculate an average, and it's going to go, ah, Monday has a different average than Tuesday. So when you create an alert 30% over the baseline, well, 30% over the baseline on Monday and Tuesday is going to be different. So you will receive alerts differently. And again, this way you can spot actual degradations in the network performance because of the baseline. 
One other thing you want to go ahead and do is download the SNMP MIB library. This is going to help you down the road when you're going to be creating custom monitors based on SNMP, QoS, uh, printing, uh, toner level, and whatnot. This way you have it already when you create the custom monitor. The, you can match the OID to the actual description of what that OID is referring to. Flow configuration is another thing to configure. By default, we have some uh, thresholds set for excluding data noise. And retention settings. Currently, everything's set to one month for both general and trend data. If you want to collect more than that, this is, uh, you know, if I want two months, just put two based on months. One thing a lot of MSPs fail to do when they initially onboard is, or when they start configuring Packet Trap, is creating a brand, branding the actual solution. Making sure that you're on the latest build, checking for updates, and creating accounts for people within their environment, or the CEOs or CTOs of a particular company. This will help you later when you're actually creating alerts or tickets. You already have the account set up, so you don't have to navigate back to the administration and set up the account. You have it. One other thing to consider is port management. We have a lot of ports that are pretty general standard, but you might have some proprietary ports. In order to monitor those ports, our system does need to know what the port is and the name to it. So if there are some proprietary ports that you don't find in here, uh, one of the things to spend some time on is to add those ports so that later on the road you don't have to do that as well. Now on that note, I'm going to go ahead and jump into our policy, kind of last thing I want to cover here, some things that people sometimes miss. By default, we have certain intervals set for the policy. If you want to add or uh, increase or decrease the delays, go ahead and do so here. Settings. So for instance, application event logs. By default, we are monitoring only errors. If you want to monitor as well information and warnings and receive alerts on them, you have to go in and highlight everything and click OK. Same thing with uh, system event logs and security event logs. SNMP traps, uh, kind of very, a little bit similar to syslogs and our uh, add and remove devices alert, and I'll talk about that in a second. As you enable SNMP traps, you're going to get a lot of SNMP traps, and to mitigate against the SNMP traps that are not relevant, you want to go ahead and start excluding them based on a particular string within the, 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 the actual name of the trap, the description of it, or the OID. So, best practice, enable SNMP traps, let it run for a week, and then go back and find the actionable traps that you want to actually monitor and receive alerts on and exclude everything else that's irrelevant. This way it'll reduce the amount of uh, traps going on the network uh, and the amount of stuff you have to go through visually and filter down the road. Uh, so this is something that you do also on the syslog and the port manager. I'll talk about that as well. So you might not have a priority knowledge of this, and that, well, that's why I say enable them and just listen to them for about a week and then go in and customize this. Uh, and this is an ongoing process. You know, every device is going to have different traps associated to it. Uh, so you, you'll be excluding different traps on different devices. Same thing with the syslog server. You can either check all the facilities and severities or uncheck them. This, our, our agent is a syslog listener, so it's going to filter the syslog messages here. For the first week or so, you might want to just collect all the syslog information, or maybe when you're troubleshooting something, you might want to collect all the syslog information and then build an actionable um, approach as you can start discarding certain syslog messages that are just irrelevant. There's over 40, 50,000 syslog messages out there, so having a priority knowledge of which ones you want uh, may be very difficult and time consuming, especially in different devices and vendors. One cool thing, though, about that within Packetrap is that 
we cannot just we don't have to specifically alert off a syslog message. We can if we can alert uh, based on what the message contains. So if you can have a general understanding of what the message might contain, we can alert off that here. So that you're not going to get bombarded with a bunch of alerts. You know, alert alert action must be taken immediately. But we can filter the alerts also with this screen. Then same thing with SNMP traps. You know, alert if any trappers received or a particular OID or trap value string contains this. Uh, raid, failure, disk array one or two or three, whatever the, the number so the whatever the level of severity is associated with it. Packet trap can alert you off if a device is connected or removed from the network. And this is one of the things you also want to go ahead and um, kind of put a dragnet on. Um, customers may have USB drives that have MAC addresses to them uh, or bring in their laptops and iPads that you just are not aware of, you don't know about. And to build an actionable or you know a realistic alert that a, a device has been added to the network that should not be there, you want to go ahead and exclude the devices that you know are constantly being added to the network. So in the first instances, run this alert and for about a week and so, or a month, wh whatever it takes. I mean, this this is not like a syslog or SNMP traps where they're constantly coming through. You know, if somebody brings in a, a, a USB drive once a month, you're not going to get an alert for a month. So you're not going to get really bombarded with a lot of this stuff here. But as, as you s start seeing alerts coming in, figure out what this particular MAC address is. And you can do that based with our network traffic flow to see the endpoints connected on it um, to see is this an actual device that I want to you know, be alerted off, or is this just something I can now start discarding? And that was a high-level overview of Packet Trap. Uh, just a quick onboarding. There'll be many videos more to come. If you have any suggestions or some videos that you'd like to see or have questions on, you know, on on, on, on best practices, if you could email me at Mike dot Plotkin P L O T K I N at Quest dot com with questions. You can also post these questions on our community and uh, either myself or somebody else will get back to you on that. Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us here today. If you have any questions and would like to find out more, you can either again contact myself at mike.plotkin, P-L-O-T-K-I-N at quest.com or contact sales at packetrap.com. You can also visit our website, packetrap.com. We're an affiliate of Quest Software, Division of Quest Software, and the Network Management Division. Thanks a lot, guys, and uh, look forward to speaking with all of you. Bye.